This week, we're reading Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater, otherwise known as My Little Bunny of a Sorcier. Hi, readers. I'm Jordan. And I'm Katie. And welcome to Not Another Heroine, the podcast where we break down the best and worst fictional heroines, those swashbuckling ladies who have to work a little harder than expected for their happy ending. Want to see what's next on our TBR list? Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Instagram for a sneak peek at upcoming content or to help us pick our next book. I feel like I should open this episode uh, with what I wrote in my uh, review of this when I first read it in 2020. In all caps... This was so cute, and I am so incredibly happy I decided to read this. Happy side the whole time. Made me feel as giddy as a schoolgirl. Made me feel light and airy and sparkly and happy. It's one of those random few books that are so encompassing and magical that you lose yourself for a little bit and come out feeling like the world isn't so dark after all. That was brilliantly put. Enamored with this book. (laughs) Yes. I also, I think I also first read this in 2020, right when it came up. Yeah. I, I think so. Uh, Let's see. It's a relatively new book. Mm -hmm. March 29th, 2020. Yes, I was away on a work trip when I read this. Oh. Yeah, and I, like, powered through it pacing in my hotel room. That's fair. I think this was right when quarantine was happening, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. March 2020? Yeah. This is a good dose of what you need during quarantine. Or maybe I read it in 2021. I'm trying to remember. Hmm. Oh, yeah, because you wouldn't have been on a work trip. Yeah. Yeah, I think I read it a year later then. Mm, that's fair. It was a pleasant discovery. I had all yeah. of the same emotions that you just described. Yeah. And the quote that they have on this book um, on the front cover just is so mm-hmm. concise. Yep. They put it perfectly, which is <laughs> whimsical but never frivolous, sweet but not sugary. I loved it. Mm-hmm. And that is exactly how I feel about this book. Literally. That's adorable. It's a feel-good book. Like one of those that you can just pick up and you're like, that was time well spent. <laughs> I wrote this in a day. It was very like, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's very approachable lengthwise. Yeah, it's, it's only 300 pages. Yeah, it's very pleasant. Um, you don't have to feel overly committed to it. You're not mm-hmm. going to forget very much if you put it down and come back to it. Mm-hmm. But you're not going to want to put it down. No. Mm-mm. You yeah. smash it out in like three hours. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Basically. Um, so this is, again, one of those books that the prologue is, like, mildly important to read. Don't um, the prologue. Yeah. It's kind of how you know what's going on. Yep. <laughs> um, so we start out with an introduction to this, like, mischievous and adventurous young girl whose name is Theodora Eloisa Charity Eddings. She later goes by Dora. Thank God, because that is a long name. But she, like most girls described in the Regency era, is attempting to escape her lessons on embroidery and go outside and climb a tree or some shit. And so she successfully escapes, that is a lot of S's all in a row, but unfortunately she meets a fate worse than embroidery lessons in Elf Appears, one Lord Hallowvale. And uh, even worse, on top of that, the young girl's mother has apparently bargained her away for her daughter's soul to this elf lord man. Okay, so we never meet... Theodora's mom, but she sounds like a total bitch. Yeah. Oh, my. You're just going to wager away your child. And I think she even has a memory later that she's like, the mom's like, oh, uh, I love my daughter. Like, I shouldn't have done that. You know, motherhood made me blah, blah, blah. But still. No. Yeah. No, absolutely not. (laughs) Like, what did she get out of this deal? I think just gold, which makes it worse. Oh, my God. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Poor <kind> of... <laughs> Dora. Uh, yeah. Horrible. And so the girl's like a little bit weirded out by this random man that has appeared in the middle of the woods. And he's like, OK, I'm going to take you away to fairyland. And he kind of touches her arm. And then something weird starts to happen. And Dora feels all like weird and cold and removed. I just want you to realize what how you said that. A strange oh. man appears out of nowhere. And tells her he's going to take her away to Fairyland and then touches her arm. Yeah, it's not that. So in the book, it's written, it's kind of like a, not fun, obviously, but it's very lighthearted when this is happening. But she feels cold and removed and like something weird is happening. Uh, But then, thank God, the girl's cousin, who's like blonde and perfectly well-mannered and like, you know, described as like the sweet princess, stabs this guy in the calf with a pair of scissors. (laughs) This was the Uh, best scene, which is... Yeah, this little girl out of nowhere, like, it's very violent. (laughs) She's like, don't make me fucking use these. (laughs) And uh, so she snags up her cousin because the blonde girl's name is Vanessa. Uh, She's Dora's cousin. Grabs Dora and runs back into the house. Uh, Lord Hallowville kind of shouts after them and he's like, God damn kids. But, uh, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) 
<laughs> but he's at least taken one half of Dora and the rest can remain for good riddance. Uh, something to that effect. So we next meet Dora at the almost spinster age of nearly 20. Uh, okay, not a spinster yet. <laughs> not even close. But okay, we'll roll with it. She said she's concerned about spinsterdom. She's 19. Like, even in that era, though. Like, That's fair. Yeah. It's like, you're a baby. <laughs> um, and she's at the garden party with the, you know, beautiful, lovely rose that is her cousin Vanessa. And they're talking to this super obnoxious old man. And he keeps saying purebred horses. Purebred. Purebred. Purebred horses. Purebred. <laughs> and uh, Dora is having this whole like aneurysm about how many times he's saying purebred. And then she kind of interrupts him and she's like, wouldn't it be interesting if a dolphin and a horse bred? Because what would the head look like and what would the tail look like? And this guy's like spluttering and like, what? what, what, what? Like, you're fucking, what are you talking about? <laughs> I could not unsee the extraordinary attorney. Woo. Oh, yeah. In this moment. <laughs> the dolphin noises. Yeah, exactly. I love that show so much. It's so cute and sweet. <laughs> so the guy's super, like, uh, weirded out, bothered by this, apparently. And Vanessa kind of smooths things over, and then they walk away elsewhere to avoid this man. And uh, it's not before Dora can privately remark on the fact that Vanessa would be married already if it wasn't for her, like, weird little outbreak comment things that she has. So she has this little moment of self-hate, but it's said in a very uh, mild tone. Um, which leads into Dora does not experience emotions the same way that other people do. Not any way in any manner close. No. She just kind of like, uh, there are clouds passing by. <laughs> so doesn't, um, in the prologue, doesn't Lord Hallowvale say something about like, I've got half of you or something? Uh, Yeah. But we never, we don't know like what that means until this first interaction. And she's like, I feel like I should be embarrassed by this, but I'm not. Yeah, she's kind of distanced. Like she's watching life happen through like from a distance. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Or like numb to things like, oh, I feel distantly weird about it, but whatever. And so Vanessa then decides that they're obviously not going to find decent husbands for either of them in the country. And so they simply must go to London for the rest of the season. And she kind of bullies her mother, Lady Lockheed, or Auntie Frances, as she's referred to throughout the book, um, into bringing both her and Dora to London because Auntie Frances is like, oh, my God, you want to go to London? This is so exciting. And she's like, yeah, and I want to bring Dora. And Auntie Frances is like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, we're just going to have the same problem there that we're having here. Um, and so they stay with the friend of the family whose name is Lady Hayworth, um, who ends up being a total bitch the whole time two thumbs down um and she's like oh i'm so excited to have you guys here and uh who who is this extra lady that is with you guys oh your cousin um okay i guess that's fine like we'll make another room <laughs> so i think it's interesting that we never get a full description of dora's appearance right yeah she's always kind of described as separate and odd and like we don't want her around here mm -hmm. um but it's because of her mannerisms, not yeah. because of what she looks like. Mm -hmm. I know she has like reddish hair. Oh, yeah. It's like a red brown. Yeah. Burnt colored. Yeah. But I think later on we kind of get a hint of what she looks like. But in this mm -hmm. beginning, it's all of all of these um, mechanisms to remove her from Vanessa and all these social mm -hmm. things are is because of how she acts. Yeah. Not because of what she looks like. Yeah. Like purely mannerism based. And so they're making introductions. And then Vanessa kind of makes these like weird acts about a certain Lord Sorcerer. Sorcerer? Sorcier? Is it like the French word? I, sorcier? I believe it is Lord Sorcier. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, Lord Sorcier. M because weirdly it's, made him more hot. <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, like uh, Lord okay. Sorcier. Um, <laughs> but it's because he it's a French title. Right? Oh, yeah. That was like a whole parallel. Because this is like a regency and there's a war against France and England. It's like an alternate reality regency england mm. and so there's a war that happens with france it's like supposed to represent i think the napoleonic wars oh that makes sense um yeah. uh they reference napoleon don't they yeah yeah but like there's weird there's yeah. magic involved so this is like alternate reality <laughs> yeah regency england. yeah regency plus magic <laughs> what do they say they have something on the cover about like the actual setting um nope i'm gonna find it later <laughs> Uh, and uh, so the Lord Sorcier is immediately described as being like an ill-mannered asshole, basically, and no one likes him. And he's like a common-born guy that was elevated because of his magic skills with a Z. Dora sort of like absently remarks at how odd it is that Vanessa's like all of a sudden like, oh, the Lord Sorcier, you say? 
Um, but she's like, oh, okay, whatever. Like, Vanessa will tell me when she's ready. Anyways, Dora is basically left on to her own devices for like the next two days while Vanessa's whisked around to like uh, clothing fittings and accessories and buying trips. And then by day two, she's like, I'm really fucking bored. And so she just walks out of the house. <laughs> I thought this was was really sad. I hate it too. Right? Like, <laughs> okay, well, we're going to do you a favor and take you with us, but we're going to banish you and like do yeah. every single thing we can to separate you from your beautiful cousin. Yeah. Ugh. But when you're reading it, it feels sad, but kind of abstractly, which mm -hmm. because Dora feels it abstractly. She's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess. She's a very go with the flow kind of character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um, she's out walking around London on her own, which Regency, that would not happen. Never happen. <laughs> Where's your maid? Where's your chaperone? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lady. <laughs> and so she's just trying to find a flavored ice shop. And she instead finds a magic bookshop. Um, and immediately she walks in and sees this mirror. And uh, unfortunately, when she looks into this mirror, the mirror part goes away and she's treated with a vision of herself in a beautiful ball gown and a beautiful brawl, brawl gown, ball, 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 ball <laughs> gown, beautiful ball I gown. I wish we were doing shots again for this episode. I would die immediately. <laughs> she's in a beautiful ball gown in a ballroom, unfortunately covered in blood. And, you know, it's Dora, so she's only mildly perturbed by this. And then a handsome man appears behind her. And then this handsome man turns out to be real. And apparently the Lord Source himself, Elias. Hi, Elias. I know. Mm -hmm. It's nice to Spain. meet you. Uh, who's described as having like silvery hair. Silvery blonde hair. Uh. As soon as I saw that description, <laughs> I'm like, Katie's gonna love it. I love it. <laughs> kind of give me like Shavraith vibe. I know Shavraith is back. Yeah. If if Shavraith was more snarky and like... He was an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. That That's Elias. Um, so Elias and his dear friend Albert Calloway and Dora have this like lovely little uh, snarky exchange. And Albert has a magical silver hand that Elias made because he, like, uh, lost his hand in the war or something. And so he's kind of seen as, like, not whole to society. But they're, like, besties. And Dora's kind of, like, staring at it absently, absently because, again, remember, she has no concept of, like, being embarrassed about things. And then I had to include this direct quote. So Elias is like, I'm quite sure it's impolite to stare at cripples. And then Albert's like, um, I don't mind. And besides, I'm quite sure it's even worse to call a man a cripple in the first place, Elias. <laughs> Love their friendship. And then there's another little witty repost repertoire repertoire you know where i'm looking I, for? I know exactly what you're working working for looking for <laughs> i just don't know <laughs> you're a hot mess Re yeah repertoire rep rep repertoire uh some kind of uh back and forth yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> elias says dim-witted people offend me further as he's talking about things that annoy him and dora's like wow that must be really difficult and he's like pardon and she says uh being by offended at yourself so very often so they're immediately off in like snarky land immediately trading barbs and it's beautiful but albert okay so i got sherlock and watson vibes yeah. on on elias and albert uh-huh it was so cute yeah because they're having like private conversations that dora's just like watching happen and they're like elbowing each other about random shit mm -hmm. like it's very fun and so albert is absolutely enchanted by finding someone that's like totally unperturbed by his asshole of a friend and he invites dora to a ball that his mother is throwing and then Dora, in very Dora-esque behavior, uh, remarks that her cousin and her are probably already invited to it, but he may need to make sure that Dora herself still has an invite because people tend to just forget her. Also, this is super um, demonstrative of like Dora's misplacement in society because yeah. at, at what point would like even now would you ever say you need to make sure like i get an invitation because <laughs> yeah. they're gonna be so rude that they deliberately leave me out yeah that's so sad yeah it's sad but also like dora like how many normal people would actually say that no uh-uh uh -uh. no because yeah you immediately get picked up on the fact that Dora's just like saying shit yeah. <laughs> has no filter yeah, no filter. What? <laughs> actually that's a great description of yeah. Dora is like no filter yep yeah. yeah but everything's said in such like a dreamy like content tone that you're like uh uh what do we do with this <laughs> okay, okay guess we're rolling with it yeah and so Elias it's fun because in this part so Elias makes some kind of snarky comment about Albert needing to be careful because you know Dora's mother's going to hear about this and immediately try to set them up and send them to the altar and in this point it it sounds like Elias felt left out of the conversation because like Albert and Dora are talking too much and he's like oh 
better watch out. She's going to like take you to the uh, altar or whatever. And then Dora just pops in and she's like, well, um, both my parents are dead. So you're good. <laughs> like, girl, <laughs> she just knows how to shut Elias down so well. Like from from moment one, he she gives him absolutely zero room yep. to like poke and prod at yeah, her. Because what do you what do you say to that? Yeah. Well, when someone is like always just basically talking shit and you're you're someone who doesn't recognize shit when it yeah. slaps him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe I skipped over because there's a point where uh Elias is trying to like buy a book or something and she's like in the way and he's he's like, why are you like staring at me so much or something? He's like, you do you want me to like whip it out and you can take your measure? And she's like, what am I measuring? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I about that part. it's like, what do you say to that either? <laughs> okay, but after this little adventure, Dora goes back to the house and explains where she was. And the mamas are obviously very disturbed that she just like walked out of the house. But she's they're also like, oh, this is kind of an opportunity because the oldest caraway son is next in line to be a Viscount. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Edward. We meet him later. Edward. And they're like, okay, this is perfect. Dora, you're going to marry Albert so that Lady Caraway is going to be thankful for marrying off this son that doesn't seem to want to ever get married. And then it'll put us in great, you know, spots to have Vanessa marry uh, Edward, the oldest son. <laughs> this was like a great, like, society comment because, yeah. like, they're pairing her off with Albert because he's physically crippled and they view her as socially crippled. Yeah. And it's just shitty. Yep. And it just... It's like, okay, you're you're going to get married to him. It's like, um, are we going to have like a conversation about mm -hmm. that? And she, I think she even like privately thinks about it. She's like, I think if I was just, you know, engaged off to someone, uh, should I be perturbed by that? She's like, eh, whatever. <laughs> just rolls with it. Yep. Um, so at the ball, Dora's like slightly apprehensive um, about the whole like, you know, blood on the dress thing. But she meets with Albert and shares a dance. And then Albert asks very politely if he if she would entertain Elias as like literally no one else would. Um, and they have another cute interaction, which I am quoting directly. Elias says, in what is it you wish for me to do with your dog, Albert? Shall I take it outside for a walk? Need I fetch some treats from the tray? From <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Need I fetch it some treats from the table? <laughs> uh, they're talking about Dora, uh, not a actual dog. And Dora says, you could try and teach me to speak, but I fear that my diction is already better than yours, Lord Sorcier. So Dora's taking no shit. Um, she also reveals now of all times what she saw in the mirror. And Elias is immediately like, you saw yourself bleeding and you didn't mention it before this, except at the fact that we are now in the exact same ballroom and I'm wearing the exact clothes you saw me in. Well, I'm concerned. <laughs> he's also like, I'm the Lord Sorcier. That like, is true. Of all people to talk to about magical weirdness. Yeah. Like, I'm the one. <laughs> I am the one. But he's also interested in that. And he's like, well, I'm probably number one person to protect you during all this. So we're set. And he decides he's going to stick close. And they kind of go off for a dance. I'm not sure how that happens because he's not a big dancer. But during this dance, you know, on one of the turns or something, Dora sees Vanessa holding a cup of punch and a light bulb goes off. After their dance, Dora literally asks him like, hey, could you go get me some punch? I'm parched. And uh, he comes back, gets elbow checked by some random dude and eventually spills punch all over her dress uh so it's not blood it's red punch but she's very satisfied that it's not blood and just like okay cool this is what i wanted to happen i out of the options blood or punch um i can think of which one i would prefer and then in another sequence of events that is very much dora she tries to clean it in the bathroom and then decides to sneak outside to avoid seeing anyone and then decides to try washing it in a fountain because wouldn't that be great it can soak it all all at one time uh but that requires her you know, taking her dress off and just in her under things, uh, which is where Elias finds her in the fountain with no clothes on. <laughs> I mean, she's clothed. Like they were like 10 Ugly. different layers of clothing <laughs> back then. Like they would be overdressed for winter, even in their underclothes. That's fair. He obviously is a bit disturbed by just seeing her in the fountain and magically cleans a dress for her because he has this cute little like, uh, I guess I have to because I like fucked it up in the first place. But it just kind of shows that he's not a total asshole. So I have an interruption here. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're, we're starting to work in our like analytical comments mm, throughout the book. And... If this book was lacking anything, it was 
background on the magic system and the world because the only person we ever see in this story that has magic is the Lord Sorcier. And we really don't get any explanation of to what does he do with his magic? How does he use his magic? Why does he have magic? And he's the only one. Like there's a magic store, Mm -hmm. but he's the only character we meet. It's kind of weird. I did not even think about that. That there's a whole. Sorry. <laughs> you kind of just like broke my brain there. Because, yeah, who's who's buying? Who's keeping this man in business? Yeah. <laughs> well, and I don't think I picked up on that on the first read. But I on the second either. read. And th- maybe this is a good test of like books that oh. withstand analysis, which is like you read it for a second time. You are able to like distance yourself from, oh, this is lovely and fluffy and mm-hmm. escapism. And we kind of get more into the heart of the story. Mm-hmm. And that was my big question, which is, where is the magic coming from? <laughs> like, who else? Who else? Ha- <laughs> really? Yes. Katie. <laughs> I feel like that's also a good uh, test of like, is this fantasy or is this romance? It's like, this is. This is. Pure. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a good, a good announcement yeah. for the readers, which is this is a romance. Yeah. Yeah. A dash. The fact it. that we just asked, where does the magic come from, um, should tell you that this is not yeah. fantasy, really. <laughs> well, okay, not quite romance. Uh, I'd say it, it's firmly in fairy tale land. Oh, okay, yeah. Because there's what, like fantasy, romance, mm-hmm. fantasy, fairy tale. Yeah, it's like fairy tale romance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So after he cleans her dress, he also reveals that Vanessa just like you know told him straight up uh, that Dora is cursed by a fairy in. <laughs> Oh, Vanessa. I know. <laughs> like, I was. <laughs> Vanessa is like the most underplayed character mm-hmm. in this book. Yeah. And she is just a badass. Yep. She just single handedly coordinated this eventual run in with the one person who could probably help her cousin. And she's like, I arranged all of this. <laughs> Anyways, she's Emma. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, we're talking about Emma from the movie Emma. Oh, my God. <laughs> Emma from the movie Emma from the Jane Austen book. Okay, whatever. Oh my god, I haven't read any of those books. It's okay. Mm-hmm. I, I haven't read most of them myself either. Oh, okay, but not in the movie. That's fair. All I can think of is a uh, Anna Taylor Joy. I sh- <laughs> if she were ever to appear in front of me, my god, I know she's mm, stunning. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's like um. This is going to sound bad, but I don't mean it in the bad way. I mean it in the good way. She's like alien beautiful. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, I read an interview with her where mm. someone like, I, I think in the beginning of her career, people kept commenting on how wide apart her eyes were. Mm, and that's like so it nice. made her super like self-conscious about it, which is uh-huh. like, no, it's what makes you like unique. Yeah. Everyone's got something different about them. She has like the elfin beauty. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like totally untouchable, not real. Exactly. <laughs> Did you see her in the menu? No. Uh-uh. Oh my god. It's very scary. Well, not scary, but it's like uh like cre- scary it's not scary. It's kind of creepy. It Ooh. makes you think a little bit. Ooh. But she's phenomenal in it. Uh, she's amazing. Yeah. Also the interviews, uh she's cool as fuck too. She was like born in Argentina, yeah. but like her dad's a diplomat or some shit. Uh, she speaks fluent Spanish like I know, like <sighs> a renaissance woman. <laughs> Like, not a small crush on this woman. Like, oh, yeah, it's a big crush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Anna Taylor Joy. Watch Emma. Actually, we talked about doing Emma for, for the podcast. Be fun. Yeah. Maybe readers upcoming will mm-hmm. do Emma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'll be confused when you see it on the roster. You're like, uh, yeah, you guys is it the did book? do Emma. Or is it the three movies that they've made so far? <laughs> not fair. Anyways. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so obviously Elias is interesting in or interested in anything that's strange and unusual. And of course he accidentally insults her by saying that because like I would not want to be called strange and unusual uh, straight up to my face. I think that would kind of hurt my feelings a little bit. But they do have this like cute little interaction. And Dora is like, I appreciate your engagement in my troubles, Lord Sorcier. I hope you do not go to too much trouble on my behalf. And he says, I go to exactly as much trouble as I like. That's cute uh, because the, he then spends a really fucking long time trying to fix her. <laughs> so this is a very, very old book. It's called Marilyn the Magician. And then the, I, I know Katie. Katie, Katie is giving you have seen me. Dear readers, uh, Katie is giving me the look like I just jumped off a fucking cliff. <laughs> I'm like, um, what? So the author is Patricia C. Reed and it's a duology. It's Marilyn the Magician and then The Magician's Ward. Also a Regency set fantasy romance. And the magician in that book is like, Elias to a T, but nicer, mm. but like in a good way. Oh, okay, fair. 
killing me. That's unfair. So uh, I need you to read that book. I know it's old. I think it came out in the... Oh, girl. <laughs> Maybe. God damn. I do like 80s music from time to time, so I will... Uh... I don't like 80s music. Girl, what? Oh, my God. Head Over Heels, the Reigns in Africa one. Tito? Tito? Oh, Dito? No. <laughs> Oh, God. That's such a good song. Rain's down in Africa. <laughs> I hate that song so, so good. Much. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Synth. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I swear I love this book. Like, please disregard all of our tangents. <laughs> um, so they have that interaction or whatever he promises to help her. Back in the ballroom, Dora dances with Albert, and she kind of explains the whole plot by their mamas for them to, like, be married. And they're kind of like cool and joking about it. And then he's like, OK, well, I guess I could just put my hat at the most unattainable woman. And Dora's like, wow, that's that's a like primo idea. Like, fucking good on you, man. Except that the most unattainable, beautiful woman is Vanessa. And so that complicates everything. And the mamas are hella pissed off at Dora. They're like, you had one fucking job. <laughs> they're sub- like super mad at her for not doing better and for probably acting weird. Those are not direct quotes, but like they could be, <laughs> which again, I poured Dora in my heart. Anyway, they immediately offer Albert for Dora to like go help him because he's a physician and he volunteers with poor people. And they're like, oh, Dora can like come with you and help you. And so the next morning, Elias shows up calling. Is that the verb for when like gentlemen? Uh, Jordan is nodding. Thank you. My Regency fact checker. Um, <laughs> so he's calling at the most like inappropriate time. It's like six o'clock in the morning, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> so I think they're supposed to call like around eleven. Oh, I, like brunch. It's like a best guess for me at that time, but it's supposed to be pretty late, and you're supposed to be like, "I'm here to see a woman, and here's my flowers." Because <laughs> uh, this man came at six o'clock in the morning with no flowers. <laughs> he's like, "There's sunlight out. It's time to <laughs> get the fuck up." <laughs> And so uh, Dora kind of like jumps down to the stairs to like intervene as Elias is about to fight the butler. (laughs) And she's like, probably should have like sent flowers and a calling card first. And he's like, bruh, I do not give a single fuck. Lady Hayworth is equally as mad because she hates Elias for some apparent reason, probably because he's ill-mannered and yucky. So again, this is a analytical comment on Mm -hmm. the structure of this for like a Regency setting. Mm. It doesn't make any sense that someone who is so elevated in status that they're Mm -hmm. the Lord Sorcier for the king. Yeah. That they would be so despised by like well-to-do people. Yeah, that is fair. It's just, it's weird. I think it's just a, a device to put like a break between mm-hmm. Elias and Dora. Mm. But like realistically, like, oh, this king loves you and gives you a title. Yeah, please come to our come party. Into my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's six o'clock, but this is fine. <laughs> anyway, so they're sitting in their little like uh, day room or wherever you bring suitors, allegedly, because Elias is going to pretend to be a suitor. And he brings with him a small mirror in order to test Dora's scrying abilities after the whole she literally to a T. Uh, forecasted what was going to happen in the immediate future. And Dora is immediately treated to like this really fucked up war scene from Elias's uh, memories in France, uh, which is literally Albert pulling like burning shrapnel from Elias's shoulder and chest, which that would be traumatizing is a little like Regency lady who has never seen anything bad in her life. But not for Dora. Yep. She's like, oh, wow, I should probably be upset by this. But like, okay. She's like, this sucks for you. And I'm sorry. (laughs) And he's like, uh, you saw that? <laughs> I am really sorry. And it's kind of nice because he's like, I'm really sorry that you had to see that. That was an unfortunate day. It was like a nice moment of humanity in a man who uh, is kind of a dick. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. Yeah. And so he then kind of surmises that his theory on what's wrong with Dora is that she has one foot in fairy. He also decides that he's going to, Jordan's laughing at something and I'm a little disturbed. <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> What? Oh, I was looking at your notes. <laughs> it says Sir Mrs. <laughs> oh. Sir Mrs. No, I know what you meant, but it's just the Sir Mrs. <laughs> it just got me. That's fair. Sir, Sir Mrs. <laughs> I wrote this before I had my coffee. <laughs> You know. I okay. know because I also wrote mine. Be- I wrote mine <laughs> ah. at five this morning. Girl, what? You're fucking pulling an Elias right now. That is not human hours. <laughs> but it's dog hours. Oh, that's fair. Mm-hmm. That is dog hours. Yeah. But then he decides he's going to call on Dora again. Um, Lady Hayworth is pissed. Uh, but he leaves the mirror as a gift for Dora. Um, he then goes on to help with some sort of like plague that's broken out just like casually. 
And then later that night, night. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the plague thing isn't a real thing. What do you mean it's not? So in the so when he what? Sh- when he shows <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when he shows up and he tells the butler like, "Hey, I'm here to see Dora." Yeah. And the, the butler's like, she's not at home, right? Pretty normal. Uh-huh. He's like, well, I can come back after I go help out with this plague, wink, wink. And like after I become infected with the plague, uh-huh. I'm going to bring it back to the house. Yeah. Jokingly. But there's a, there's not a real plague. But there's a plague that happens in this. There, But not that plague. I think he, he oh, says, he says, uh-huh. he threatens the butler, like, I'm going to infect your whole household. That's smooth. I thought there was an actual plague. Okay. I, well, there okay. is, but not well, this maybe, plague. Maybe there is. Maybe <laughs> I read it wrong, too. No, yours makes way more sense. It's like a snarky. I think he's being like a snarky asshole. Like, I'm just going to bring the black plague. Yeah. I guess we should always default to plague and him being an asshole. (laughs) Yeah. Fair. And so Dora's inspecting the mirror and then she thinks about Elias only to actually see him literally uh, real time in the mirror. And then Elias also has this like snarky, like, it took you fucking long enough. Like, my first assumption if I was gifted a mirror is not to immediately scry on someone. <laughs> no, I'd be like, oh, does my hair look okay in the yeah. back? Let's check it out. Yeah. <laughs> not to talk to someone like a, you know, Regency iPhone. But Elias reveals <laughs> that's a cool <laughs> shirt. Regency iPhone. I mean, it is. Um, <laughs> but oh, yeah. So he also like further theorizes about what's wrong with Dora because he couldn't really say everything in front of lady hayworth um he thinks that part of dora like half of her lol half a soul worth maybe um is still in fairy and that part is the part that lord hollowvale stole when she was a kid and so then they have some you know back and forth back and forth and because this is a regency romance he asked that she call him elias oh first name oh and then she's like okay but you have to call me dora and he immediately is like miss eddings and she's like no you said you know you're gonna call me dora and he's like uh uh, okay dora it was adorable anyway dora the next day is ferried off to help albert and they really horribly go to a working house i did not know these were a thing until i was listening to a podcast about jack the ripper in all the working houses, they're fucked up. It's they're really messed up. If you read about like workhouses from like the what nineteenth and twentieth century, mm-hmm. and then debtors' prisons are also Ooh. like equally bad. So Charles Dickens writes a oh, yeah. lot of books, uh, like a lot of social commentary built into it on this whole system. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's fucked up. I say that because I watched the. BBC um, shows on his books, not because I've actually read a lot of John <laughs> I was Charles about Dickens. to say, like, that's a flex, okay. <laughs> no, no, never read the books. Fair. Not me. That's Rob. <laughs> that is true. He's probably like, you guys didn't read anything nope. by... No. No TV shows all the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. And then also, obviously, she needed a chaperone, which is a Miss... I don't know what that her last name is. I don't think it's Miss Eddings. It's Jennings. Jennings. Think, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jennings. Probably. Some girl. Um, But this uh, chaperone has been specifically told to ignore any direct flirting as much as propriety can absolutely allow. And so that ends up with Dora, like, in a lot of circumstances, unchaperoned with a man. Uh, That happens, like, two or three times in this book. Yeah, that explains that, allegedly. Plot device. A little bit. Yeah, so they go to the workhouse, and everything is, like, really fucked up, and both the chaperone and Dora are, like, actually cool to help, despite being, you know, Regency ladies and you know, not seeing anything so gross. Um, and Albert's kind of like impressed by them just being regular people, like <laughs> a little bit insulting, but uh, well intended. And just background on Miss Jennings, she's described as like a single woman in her like early 30s. Um, a spinster. A spinster. <laughs> yeah. The evil word. Uh, but yeah, she's just a woman that did not get married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so Dora helps stitch a leg and then Right after that, they find a young girl who is suffering from what they're referring to as the sleeping plague, which is uh, she fell asleep and will not get back up. So Albert immediately sends for Elias because they're under the impression that this is kind of some like fucked up magic plague. And so he immediately shows up like an hour later and Dora's like, oh, I feel something at the side of him. Uh, But it's not something anything, you know, big feeling because Dora cannot feel any kind of big feelings. Oh, I love I so I quoted that later on. So the way Dora e- explains how she feels things. Oh yeah. The long-tailed feelings and the short-tailed feelings. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about? 
Yeah. So Dora describes her feelings as not like that immediate rush of like anger or what does she say? She doesn't feel scared, but she feels dread. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the afterwards. It's emotions that linger for a longer. So like more subtle emotions Mm -hmm. that last. Yeah. She feels some kind of emotion like that for our dear Lord Sorcier. Aww. So cute. It's adorable. <laughs> and so um, Elias, I loved the scene. Like, I don't know why, but it kind of gave me some uh, weird feelings. Um, so he immediately picks up the girl and he's like, okay, I'm going to take her somewhere safe, you know, obviously safer than this workhouse. And Dora all of a sudden is like out of the blue, like, I want to come with you. And she's like, I don't know why I said that. And she obviously can't recognize why she said that, but we, the readers, know exactly why she said that. And so her and her chaperone go with Elias to take this girl somewhere. And that somewhere ends up being like a really nice orphanage that's run by a woman named Miss Dunn. And uh, Miss Dunn is not fucking around because she immediately reveals that Elias gives like 90% of their budget. So he is an asshole and disliked by most people, but he also gives most of his people or his money to an orphanage and children. (laughs) <laughs> Jordan leaned forward to say something and then decided no. I just remember like before we started recording us talking about that as a easy way to make a character more likable. It's oh. like, oh, do they love children? Okay, there you got go. it. <laughs> What's a counterbalance for asshole? <laughs> that did literally just happen. Um, and so he brings up the girl up to the top floor where Miss Dunn is kind of reserved a room for these like plague victims. And so uh, Miss Jennings helps Miss Dunn with lunch. And so Dora is left unintentionally alone with Elias. And they kind of share this like cute moment of like mutual horrors that the evils of the workhouse and Elias is fucked up about it. And he's like kind of upset that Dora has seen it for the first time and really upset about it because she even starts crying for probably the first time in her adult life. And um, he kind of like gives her a little squeeze on the shoulder that eventually turns into a hug um that's that's very scandalous in this oh yeah (laughs) that's like fucking taking off all your clothes and streaking or something and in addition to them calling each other by their first names you guys can see where this is going (laughs) um so that night dora scries again on elias and the two discuss this like plague and he reveals that it's happened to a number of children and they all eventually die because it's extremely difficult to take care of someone who's sleeping because they won't eat or drink. And so um, Elias looks really burnt out and Dora wants to touch his hand, but obviously she's crying, so she can't. And um, she offers as a way to like help him feel better that maybe they can go watch the children at the workhouses and interview them and see if they can find any like common trend to like why this is happening. And so they also have another cute interaction where Dora is talking about how fucked up the workhouses are. And then she's like, it's okay that you need to focus on this like immediate, you know, child killing disease before you can focus on my thing. And Elias says in a very roundabout way that he's happy that she like decided to scry with him that Aww. night. Adorable. That's so cute. That's super cute. This is the cute book. It is. It makes you feel sparkly. So the next morning, Dora tells Vanessa that Elias is going to help the plague victims before he can fix her problem. And Vanessa is really irritated, upset about this. And she's like, but I care about you. I don't care about these children. And Dora's like, what the fuck? Like, that's kind of fucked up. This is Dora opening up her eyes as to like more about Vanessa. Yeah, because she always like put Vanessa on a little bit of a pedestal. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, you're maybe you know, a real human with facets. <laughs> it, okay, but it makes you wonder if Dora felt more, if she mm-hmm. would have the same view of Vanessa or mm. if she would be as compassionate as she was. That's fair. Because I feel like um, everything's through the filter of no feelings. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, Vanessa is exactly who I feel like I probably should be. But she also doesn't feel anything for regular people, apparently. Mm-hmm. And so Dora kind of issue, issues, 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 issues. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Uh, Gives an ultimatum to Vanessa that Vanessa needs to go to the workhouse before Dora is able to forgive her like callousness and for just not caring about children dying. Walking back to her room, though, she hears a commotion at the front door and Lady Hayworth is angrily, you know, yelling about something again. And so she walks up to see this giant, beautiful bouquet of flowers, um, half an unnaturally incredible shade of green and the other a barely there smoky gray, the exact shade of her eyes. <laughs> Lady Hayworth is sure that Elias has sent them in spite, and Dora, privately happy, takes them off her hands. She's like, oh, I'll just like, take these or, like, really quick. Oh, that is the one, like, physical description we get of Dora, is that her eyes are mismatched. Yeah. Uh, one's green and one is gray. Yeah. 
adorable. Also that he, after only a few interactions, knows exactly the shade of her eyes. There are people we've been working with for years that can tell you what their <laughs> eye color is. So. Uh, brown? <laughs> yeah. Except right before she can kind of like sneak away, though, Lady Hayworth makes this like really fucked up comment. She's like, Elias is purposely trying to ruin his friend's chances, Albert being the friend, of getting married with Dora. And it's not like he's even intending to marry you. And it's like, ow. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you it's just how callous that these two like mama figures are they treat her as if she can feel nothing yeah. not that she can feel different things yeah and i feel like too um you can abstractly understand that a comment hurts you know what i mean maybe not feel like specifically hurt by it but you're like that's a fucked up thing to say so dora mentions a few times throughout the book that she has this well of mm. stored negativity that mm -hmm. like these comments she saves in mm -hmm. to like dwell on later mm. and it's like she's stacking up all of these hurtful things that she doesn't process immediately but she processes and processes them later as like a long-tailed emotion mm. it's just That's uh, sad. It's sad and it's just how an not maybe not unintentionally callous, but they almost take advantage of the fact that she can't feel emotions that's like everyone else. It, yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. They, they've realized that she just doesn't she doesn't give the appearance of caring what anyone yeah. says about her. So or like say, reacting. Yeah. So they say whatever they feel. Because mm. that's fucked up. Yeah. Like just he sent this beautiful roses and you're like, well, he's not actually going to marry you. It's like, can you go fuck yourself? <laughs> it's kind of the same thing with Albert, too. Like, yeah. oh, you're just a fucking cripple. And like, even his friend is like, oh, you're you're a cripple. Yeah. It's like, like let's maybe not throw around that term. <laughs> yeah. Not OK. Yeah. And so Dora is kind of like obviously happy about the roses that are perfectly, you know, the shade of her eyes. But she's also abstractly upset by the comment because she kind of believes it. Um, she kind of thinks that Elias is just using this uh, courting ruse as a way to talk to her and help her solve her fairy curse. And so upstairs, she's just kind of like absently staring at the roses again. And she sees this the little like handwritten card that has, you know, Lord Elias Wilder. And I guess they're not supposed to be handwritten. Do, is that a Regency thing? I have no idea. Oh, because she remarks how it's like written in his own hand and it's kind of sloppy. And she's like, aw. <laughs> it, yeah, that was just really cute. And then um, she also has a little voice in her head that says, imagine if only these flowers were meant sincerely. And that hurt. <laughs> that hurted. Yeah. <laughs> That hurt my soul. Anyway, she's like, oh, I have more important things to worry about flowers. But you can be upset about something like that and also worry about the world's troubles. I wonder. So normally a character experiencing this level of like hurt mm -hmm. and insult like again and again and again would be probably emotionally trying to read. But because we're yeah. getting it through her lens of somewhat distance mm -hmm. and clinical, it's kind of you just go with it. Yeah. It's weird because it hurts like abstractly. You're like, oh, that's fucked up. But then you're like, OK, this is fine. Like mm. she's moving on to something else. You kind of take on her clinicalness almost. Yeah. You know? um, and so the next few days they can con they can <laughs> <laughs> <Rewind. laughs> the next few days they continue going to different workhouses to go and interview children. And Miss Jennings. Oh, this is when she reveals that she's a spinster and a governess. And she's like, you need to make it work with Albert. Like, do not become a spinster like me. They're they go back to the house and they're getting ready for a private dinner at the Caraway house, which is Albert's family's house and they get there and everything's nice except that lady caraway has sat dora and albert right next to her at the end of the table everything's fine that is until the butler comes in to announce that one lord elias wilder is there for albert i love lord calloway in this he's like fucked up excited about it he's like hell yeah send the man in and lady caraway is like kind of pissed off because she's like like i'm trying to set up albert and dora except like elias keeps like talking to dora can you like maybe you know remove your head from your asshole like one time and maybe say no to this man but like lord caraway is like fuck yeah like come in like how's it been man i love you uh, I just I just it's love a, I mean, it's adorable <laughs> because, you know, the whole background here is that, you know, Elias saved their their son's life. Mm -hmm. So, like, obviously, Lady Caraway loves him, too. But she's like also wants the best for Albert. And yeah. she thinks that Dora is the best for Albert. Mm -hmm. But he's just anyways, I'm going to, like, come and interrupt your plans. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he needs like a translation of something in French and both. Albert and Dora speak French, and he's like, oh, I'll just sit in between you guys, which, okay, now Albert that's and Dora not are not that sitting happens. next to each other. <laughs> I think that's a that's a thing in these, like, the seating arrangements are, like, way overdone. Like, mm. you do, like, you sit certain people next to each other based on rank and mm -hmm. then based on, like, man, woman. 
I'm so for He's like, like, I'm just going to get in here. <laughs> get in where you fit in. Um, and s- <laughs> Is that not good? Get in where you fit in. <laughs> so inappropriate. Oh, my God. <laughs> that it is. Uh, we both read Love Theoretically. And so that oh, is. Oh, I a- <laughs> know. There's, we, we are on a uh, steamy romance. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, yeah. So Elias is super tired and exhausting looking, though, and Dora, like, immediately was like, uh-oh. Uh, doesn't done Miss Feed... Or, doesn't dumb. <laughs> what do you say? I am having an aneurysm trying to read this. And she makes the offhand comment, like, doesn't Miss Dunn feed you? Talking about the orphanage, you know, headmaster. Oh, because Mrs. Dunn is also, like, his... What's the employee, head? Head maid. Um, what's the word for, like, the head... Uh, oh, fuck. What is that word? I've seen it a bajillion times. Yeah. Uh, there's the butler and then there's the... I, yeah. I don't remember what it's called. Fuck. I don't know. Yet another word. This is flashlight all over again. <laughs> oh, my God. Or the flashlight wasn't even the word. Flashlight flares. Flare. Flares. <laughs> flares. Um, yeah. And so she makes this offhand comment. And then later Caraway is like, um, wait a second. Like, are you talking about Miss Dunn that runs an orphanage that we all like put money towards? Like, is that the Miss Dunn that you're talking about? And Dora is like, oh, opportunity. Yeah. Elias may act like an asshole, but he's really charitable and amazing. And he just likes to hide it. And Elias is blushing during this, which I love. Like, I mean, when you're a platinum blonde, too, you're going to blush like <laughs> yeah. no. <laughs> he's like described as his whole face is red and his ears are red <laughs> and so this immediately cures all of lady caraway's like annoyance and anger and she's like my little bunny of a sorcier like i love you again <laughs> my, my little bunny of a sorcier i think we just found our episode title that we did yeah. my little bunny of a sorcier because she immediately is like oh you need to eat more like you need to rest you look horrible like you're working yourself way too hard and it's like you were just hating on this man two seconds ago And so they talk about Lady Cushing's upcoming ball. And I think Elias being tired has removed some sort of like sensor from him because he's immediately like, Dora, you need to at least promise me one dance. And Dora's like, (laughs) brain stutter, what? And then she's like, well, I don't really trust that you're going to show up at any of these balls because you hate balls and you hate society. So if you do show up, I'll reward you with any two dances that you want. Remember that. Please remember. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then Elias is like, the lady misjudges my determination. I fucking Uh. swooned. (laughs) I finally understand the whole like when you pass out uh, like Regency ladies because they're like overwhelmed or something. That was me. <laughs> Blacked out. <laughs> Except it immediately gets sad. <laughs> um, and so they're talking about charitable works. And Elias, you know, he's all tired and bitter from this plague that is literally killing children. Uh, he's like, you know what really grinds my gears? And Miss Caraway is like, give it to me straight. I just want to know. Like, tell me what ails you, Elias. And Elias says some really fucked up angry things about rich people just being content to be rich and ignore society's problems and not give as much as they could. And he gets more and more mad as he's talking. And out. Albert gets caught in the crossfire. And finally, Elias is like, I don't know how anyone can just sit here and eat this fancy fucking dinner while his girl is literally laying there dying. And then he exits the room after that little. This was a lot. Yeah. Like the whole table goes silent. Yeah. And everyone's like, well, we know he's right, but he's also an asshole about it. And he's also talking about us right now, like, what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> he just called all of us like selfish, rich buttheads. And he's kind of right. Yeah. So it hurts more. <laughs> so Adora uh, is immediately like this absolute hobnob. And she asked Lady Caraway, could you please come chaperone because I need to go rip the Lord Sorcier a new one. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what happened. <laughs> it, it is. And so uh, they find him standing out in the rain, you know, alone, having his emo moment. And is it really is it really raining? Yeah, it's like sprinkling. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> he probably has like scraggly, like waterlogged hair. And he's like, I'm sad. <laughs> um, and so he's, you know, alone and sad and depresso. And Dora's like, bruh, you need to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. And she's also like, um, I know you're angry, but I feel like your anger is just covering up your grieving. And you need to let yourself just grieve. And you've said some things that you're going to regret. And you should maybe apologize to the people that you care about and love in your life. Uh, he looks absolutely miserable, but he's like, you're you're right. And Dora, this is a direct quote, says, oh, brother. Oh, Oh, bother. Oh, bother. <laughs> you read it. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, bother. I am about to flout propriety. La- Lady Caraway, please do be kind. Um, and then she gives the man's a giant ass hug. 
It's cute. And then it's sad because he starts crying, like sobbing. And Lady Carraway is like, uh, wow, this is inappropriate, but also really fucking sad. And so Elias is like, uh, I'm going to fail again, which crushing my soul. He is literally, you know, taking this very personally that these children are dying. And he's like, everything, you know, everyone is just going to pretend like everything is fine and dandy. And I am falling apart. And Lady Carraway is like, oh, like... <laughs> I know this is inappropriate, but you poor little sad little sorcy of my little bunny. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so she's like, okay, we're going to give more than we already do. And I know it's not enough, but at least it's something. And he's like, I'm really fucking sorry for all that like shit that I said in there. And she's like, apology accepted. The person you really need to apologize is to is my son. And he's like, that's fair. And so he heads upstairs to actually get some sleep and eat and get dry clothes and apologize to his best friend. And Lady Caraway kind of like talks to Dora after and she's like, well, you're going to be canonized for that miracle. And then says that I would have loved you as a daughter. Uh oh. I know. It's so Lady cute. Lady Calloway <laughs> is one of my favorite characters. Same. Except Dora is a little bit perturbed by that comment because that means that Lady Caraway now knows that uh, Dora and Albert are not actually going to end up together. Yeah. Ew, the is up. <laughs> but I think it's also jarring for Dora because it's yeah. the first thing like an older woman mm-hmm. is being kind and gentle and welcoming to her. Yeah. It's the first like it's the only time she's experienced. Mm-hmm. And I think it's also jarring for her because it's the first time an outside person has commented on her relationship with the Lord Sorcier mm-hmm. and like been like, oh, this is a little bit maybe something more than just friends. And she's like, what? <laughs> but also approved of her like unconventional methods of handling yeah. a social situation. <sighs> Good for Dora. This yeah. was needed. Yeah, very much needed. It's <laughs> a was scene. It's a very positive note to end on. Not positive for Elias. Yeah, poor little honey buns. I love that so much. <laughs> it just it made me smile just reading it. Uh, yeah, because he's an asshole, but he's one of those people that tries to hide the fact that he's a good person behind his assholeness. And it's like, buddy, just be a good guy. It's like he's an asshole because he cares too much. Mm-hmm. And like there's yeah. those people who overcorrect one way or the other. Yeah. 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 I love him though. <laughs> this is this is such a great book. It's, it's such a, an easy read. Yes. It's one of those that uh just read it anyways. Like even if you're like, this isn't my normal cup of tea and I'm not normally a big Regency person, but I fucking devoured the shit. <laughs> it just it flows well. And even though like you're sitting in the perspective of a character that doesn't feel uh, conventionally um you still feel engaged with her as yeah. the narrator mm-hmm. and you want the best for her yeah mm-hmm. it's just it's adorable it's cute but yeah that's where we will end that is Part where one. we will end so from our shelf to yours we'll see you on the next page Hi, readers. If you'd like to help us pick our next book, send us a message on Instagram. Or if you'd like to just listen, we post new episodes every Monday and Wednesday on Spotify, Apple, and Amazon. Thanks for listening. Bussin'.